Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for, for making it. Um, it's, it's good to, to, to see some familiar faces again, and I hope you've enjoyed your first day at the BLED uh, Strategic Forum. My name is Grégoire Ross, and I coordinate political um, dialogue at the BMW Foundation, a 50-year-old organization that is committed to promoting responsible leadership in politics and business and to advancing a fairer, more just and sustainable socioeconomic system through the fulfillment of the UN 2030 agenda. Before we welcome our, our great panel on stage, I should like to uh, congratulate once again the tremendous team behind that incredible forum. Um, obviously, the, um, um, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister of Slovenia for welcoming us in, in BLED. Um, the Slovenian government, as well as the incredible team working under the great leadership of Peter, whom you, I'm sure you've all got to hear, if not meet uh, now, has been making that place for the past 70 years into an ever better space uh, where uh, free discussions um, can bring very different profiles to address some of the most pressing challenges of our time. Talking of which, um, of all the big trends, um, that 2022, this incredibly disruptive year, has accelerated, and we've obviously all got in mind the uh, Russian war on Ukraine, as well as the unprecedented heat waves that have characterized our summer wherever we come from. Um, the nexus and interconnectedness between food, climate, and security is perhaps one that has the most significantly worsened over the past uh, 12 uh, months. Um, Ukraine and the conjunction of droughts and uh, heat waves on pretty much every single continent um, has but exacerbated commodity prices tensions that had already significantly soared since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Our world is indeed in a much different state today than it was in 2015 when it committed to uh, ending hunger and food insecurity by um, 2030. The reason is sad, but it is simple. Rising regional conflicts, climate change acceleration, um, more economic downturns significantly increased by global pandemic uh, have been the major drivers of that global slowdown. So the question is, how do we get back on track? Um, and how do we ensure greater resilience of our global food supply chains, um, and why uh, we also advance more sustainable farming at the same time. And of course, the big question, how have those past few months, as disruptive as they've been, um, reminded us of the urgency of more resilient, stronger international partnerships uh, while doubling down on our efforts to advance carbon neutrality? Many questions are very much aware um, that we will obviously not uh, answer as we would ought to given the very limited time at our disposal. But we will nonetheless come up um, with pathways for uh, policy reforms, for more cooperation, for more resilient food systems. And to help me in that quest today, I'm very privileged to be joined by an outstanding panel and um, I would like to um, stress the fact that we have um, perhaps one of the most diverse panels today with speakers coming from Asia, Africa, Europe and America. I'm very happy to welcome on stage Ambassador uh, Agnes Marie Shimberi Molande. Ambassador Molande has been permanent representative of Malawi to the United Nations since 2021 after an impressive 50-year career at the United Nations Development Program. With us today as well, um, Dr. Uh, Professor Emil Eriavets, um, who is the Dean of the Biotechnical Faculty and Professor of Agricultural Policy and Economics at the University of Ljubljana. Um, very interestingly enough, in the years 1998 to 20, uh, 2004, Professor Riavets was leading the Agriculture Task Force um, in the negotiation team for EU accession of Slovenia. And I really look forward to hearing 
uh, his input in that important discussion today. With us today, someone whom, needs, whom we no longer need to introduce because he seems to be all over the news these days, Dr. Martin Frick, who is um, the uh, director of the World Food Program based in Berlin. Uh, I think it would take us far too much time uh, to delve into the CV of Dr. Frick. Uh, he is a Korea diplomat from Germany and has spent um, the past 15 years working for various UN organizations, uh, namely the UNFCCC that hosts the famous Climate COP conference every year, uh, was also instrumental in 2007 under the, the, the German presidency of the EU in creating the UN uh, Council of uh, Human Rights. And last but not least, if I'm not mistaken, you worked in the early 2000s for Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer. Dr. Frick, a warm welcome. With us today, we're joined by someone who apparently waited to join the Bled Forum to go on a well-deserved retirement, uh, Dr. Tasso Saniotis, who is a European Commission veteran who spent the past decades uh, working on uh, agricultural issues, the former chair of the Agricultural Market Information System and our former director for strategy uh, at the famous, well-known European Commission's Director General for Agriculture and Rural Development. I'm, we're also joined online by a very Dutch diplomat, and I hope that we will get to see the ambassadors. Wonderful. So, Dr. Hans Orvein, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Ambassador Orvein is uh, the current elected independent chairperson of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, who served before that as permanent representative of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the UN Organization for Food and Agriculture. Uh, it would also take us ages to go through his complete CV. He's a, been a senior figure in the Dutch government uh, as a leading expert in the Ministry of Economic Affairs for Agricultural uh, Food Safety and Policy, as well as Biodiversity Management. And last but not least, he's also a, a leading figure in academia as a professor um, in um, practice and natural resources and policy at uh, Tufts University in the Fletcher School for Law and Diplomacy. Ambassador, a warm um, welcome. And last but not least, we're very privileged um, to have with us today uh, um, um, Assistant Secretary of State um, Michel Sisson um, with us today, who is a Korea ambassador and who has been serving in, his, in her current position since December 2021. Um, Assistant Secretary Sisson has held an impressive number of, of uh, leading positions on pretty much every continent, uh, namely Asia, Pakistan, of course, uh, 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 India, IT, uh, Cameroon, uh, Togo, Benin, uh, and so many other uh, um, um, locations around the globe. And since 2005, has served as U.S. ambassador to, um, namely, uh, uh, Lebanon, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, um, acting uh, ambassador to the U.N., deputy ambassador to the U.N., and last but not least, ambassador to IT. Uh, Assistant Secretary, a warm welcome. <coughs> So 2022 has um, definitely been um, the incredibly disruptive year in the geopolitical book. Um, and the thing is that we run the risk that it becomes the norm by any standard. Uh, and if we all wish that it doesn't, uh, everything seems to suggest that it's all likely to become the norm. And one can only hope that it doesn't, given the fact that as food is concerned, it has clearly become a security concern. And not just for the so-called developed countries, uh, for everyone in Europe, in the US, um, in China, even in the most advanced and industrialized um, economies. So we're all on that same boat together. So I'd like to ask, as a, as a, for the sake of a short introduction, our panelists to share with us for a couple of minutes before we engage in a panel discussion, um, to tell us how we went so swiftly from talking about food security to food insecurity, and what has not worked, and what should be improved, so that we make sure that food insecurity remains a slogan uh, for a terrific session at the Bled Strategic Forum, but does not turn into reality. And I would like to start with Dr. Niotis. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to join my first post-retirement panel on things that I've been doing for so many years before retirement. Now, there are, uh, first of all, it didn't happen overnight. We did have the signals, 
that we didn't want to be leaving all of the signals. But it happened in three particular areas that we need to focus on. The first one has to do with what is happening in agricultural markets. And that's the first the big unknown about what will happen in the future and where agricultural markets are going to uh, set. Uh, I was about to stay stabilized, but you know, arrive at a, an unstable potential equilibrium. The second thing that uh, has been taking place is the link of uh, agriculture to energy, direct or indirect. I mean, we've known for years that 40% of U.S. corn goes to cars, more than 50% of sugar cane in Brazil goes to cars, uh, and we spoke a lot about it, uh, sometimes overstating the real impact it had in agricultural prices. What we had uh, underestimated is the more indirect uh, link of agriculture to energy through fertilizers. And when in Europe, for example, we saw the quadrupling last year, before even the war, of the prices of natural gas, while they doubled in the US, our fertilizer industry uh, prices went through the roof and the impact went straight into the farmers. The third thing that happened, and that's completely new, and nobody knows how it's going to end, is of course war and all the instability that it has introduced. And I would like, uh, I had prepared the PowerPoint that I will make available in LinkedIn, but there are a couple of numbers that are important and indicate what really shocked the agricultural markets and raised the issue of food insecurity in such ways. If you look over the last 30 years into wheat, which is a basic staple and food security definition crop, if you want, if you look at the US and the EU together, the big old giants of agricultural markets, they dropped their net surplus of wheat by 7 million metric tons, mainly because of the US. If you look at China and India, they increased slightly their surplus uh, by 12 million uh, metric tons, which is little if you look at their sizes. If you look at the other traditional old exporters, Canada, Australia and Argentina, plus 2 million metric tons. These are peanuts in a big market. If you look at Russia and Ukraine together, over the last 30 years, they went plus 62 million metric tons. If you look at rest of Asia and Africa together, they went minus 60 million metric tons. So what you had is the gains of Russia and Ukraine were covering, if you want, the losses of Africa and the rest of Asia. And that's what is at the core of the big insecurity uh, right uh, now uh, that we're facing. And in my view, well, I hope it will come in the discussion, this is why we need to go back to some of the basics and also to some of the, part of the basics is one of the frustrations I have over my decades of working. <laughs> Lately, we talk too much in general terms and pay too little attention in the hardcore numbers that underline what we want to say. And we need to go back to these numbers and understand what are the linkages of the various markets and sectors. Because there is another area, then I will finish with that, that becomes very important, which is trade. Whenever this war ends, and whichever way it's going to end, the question will be asked, it happened to Ukraine, it can happen to everybody. So what type of trade flows are we going to see in the future? What changes in trade flows will we be seeing? And what impact are these changes in trade flows are going to have in this debate about uh, food security and its link with climate action? But with that, I hope we'll have the time to come up later. Thank you, thank you very much. I'd like to turn to, to Assistant uh, State Secretary Sisson, because I know you've been working a lot on um, really raising awareness around the interconnectedness between food and security. Thanks so much, and I think, um, again, as you said, congratulations to the organizers of the Blood Security Forum and, and the government of Slovenia for highlighting not only regional and international peace and security issues, but food insecurity, water, climate, all of these are peace and security issues. So you asked, you know, how we went so swiftly um, from food uh, security to food security discussions to the food emergency or the food crisis uh, discussions, and, and how, do we, how do we improve? How do we move forward? Uh, well, you know, first of all, yes, uh, climate, drought, flooding, uh, the COVID-19 supply chain disruptions, 
that had already, of course, uh, exacerbated uh, food insecurity in so many parts of the world. But as we've seen since February of this year, Russia's unprovoked, unjustified war on Ukraine has created unprecedented new levels of food insecurity in Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia. Um, it's, a, it's a direct result. And of course, the fuel prices uh, and the energy uh, uh, markets have, have been disrupted as well. But if we look at what can, what can we do as the, as the member states, what can we do as the international community? I think you, di you did say raising awareness, so I will say in May, the U.S. had the presidency of the United Nations Security Council. We put forward a call to action, a roadmap. Slovenia was one of the first signers. Now there are more than 100 member states who have signed on. Uh, so we, we're looking at um, a variety of areas which seem quite simple as you take them one by one, but we've got to attack all of these areas um, simultaneously. We've got to continue to contribute to hu the humanitarian uh, response. Well, that's WFP in, in large part. We've got to better coordinate our food assistance. We've got to keep agricultural markets open. We've got to avoid unjustified uh, or, or restrictive uh, trade measures. And we've got to invest. And we've got to think about the long-term investment in fertilizer production. We've got to look at the long-term building of resilience for robust global food systems. And, and I think what is troubling um, to me right now is that I do see um, you know, this, we, we've seen for years actually this juxtaposition. You see the increase in um, the humanitarian aid levels, and that's due to the generosity of, of the world's people reaching out to those who are, who are vulnerable. But then you see a long-term decrease, a long-term decrease in, in the research, um, a long-term decrease in um, studies on, on market access and so forth. So it's the balance of the short-term needs and that we all know uh, is long-term. And I think, you know, governments don't have all the answers international organizations don't have all the answers. We need an inclusive approach. We need to include the private sector. We need to include uh, NGOs, the private sector. That's where innovation is going to come from. Um, NGOs, that's where the information sharing on best practices um, um, in, in, in uh, climate resistant uh, techniques, on, on new technologies, on, on, on sharing these best practices at the local level. So we, we don't have all the answers as governments or international organizations. Um, and, and I think uh, this panel is an excellent place maybe to start at the forum and talking about how all this should come together. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Assistant Secretary, for that. Um, I'm a bit um, puzzled because I thought that the World Food Program had all the answers. <laughs> so I'll turn to Martin Frick because perhaps he might reassure me. I wish we had. Um, my boss always uses to say my job is to put WFP out of business. Unfortunately, we are very far away from that. I, I think it's worthwhile recording that in 2015, the world was so optimistic about fighting hunger that one of the sustainable development goals, number two, is zero hunger. Here we are seven years later, mm -hmm. and we are miles away from it. Um, why did that happen so far? I found it fascinating, the shift in the production, absolutely. Um, but we also have twice as many conflicts as we had 10 years ago. And 60% of the world hunger is still a direct function of conflict. It's man-made, it's human-made. And, you know, in that case, actually, uh, it's even appropriate not to use gendered language and say it's man-made, because mostly it is man-made indeed. Um, then there is COVID, and COVID has shown us the vulnerability of supply chains. It has also shown us the lack of equity in food systems, because the world's worst paid jobs are in food systems. And it's not a wonder that the first areas in which we have seen massive outbreaks of COVID were with fruit pickers or migrant workers working in slaughterhouses under the worst conditions. But it has exposed the vulnerability. And then there is climate change. Climate change has grown from the elephant in the room to the mammoth in the room, now to the dinosaur in the room. 
because every single year we are hit, we are most, um, we are harder hit than the year before. This trout that we are currently witnessing is basically happening in the entire northern hemisphere and it's going to get worse. This is the coolest summer of our future. Let's not forget that this is coming um, even more home than we had predicted five years ago to be in 2040. Now, all of these compounded effects have um, caused a steep increase in the number of acutely hungry people. 2019, we had 150 million acutely hungry, not chronically, chronically is a lot more, but acutely hungry people, basically people the World Food Program has to look after. By the end of last year, that was already 276 million. The increase so steep that my boss called that this is the worst humanitarian crisis since Second World War. And that was before one single shot was fired in Ukraine. And here on the 24th of February, Russia basically invades in Ukraine and takes overnight the five, fifth largest wheat producer of this planet offline. And that has driven the hunger numbers up to 345 and counting. It's really a humanitarian um, situation as we haven't seen it in decades. So on the political response side, um, if I try to look at the positive of it, then it's exactly the understanding that you just mentioned, that food security is a mirror of heart security. These things are interconnected. And you cannot expect a stable world if you have a food insecure world. Um, the bread price has always been a political price. And in the um, recent past, we know that while it was not the reason for the Arab Spring, it certainly was a trigger for the Arab Spring. So we are in a double challenge. Of course, as a humanitarian organization, we are walking around with a donation box and um, begging for the people who need the money. And I think it's worthwhile to mention that the US has massively stepped up their contributions to the World Food Program. Um, Germany, our second biggest donor, um, as the lead of the G7 presidency, has also made food security a leader's issue in the recent G7 summit. So the awareness is there. But we must not stop answering the humanitarian crisis. We need a fundamental shift in food systems, and that means rethinking the food production worldwide, relocalizing to a certain extent food production. And I say to a certain extent because food independence is a pipe dream for many countries, but more regional markets, more local production. And in, um, importantly, particularly when you look at the impact of climate change, diversifying food production, not being so dependent on a handful of staple crops, but investing research and development also in traditional crops, millet for example, sorghum, all the things that are more adapted in tropical climates than production of wheat and corn, um, diversify and empower smallholder farmers, particularly women, and that starts with land tenure rights um, for women. So while we are addressing an immediate situation, we cannot afford to neglect anyone of the other crisis and we need to work in a long-term perspective. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, jumping on that, uh, especially your comment as regards the need to empower women and to take the full measure of the importance of women all along the global food supply chain, from the very beginning in farms until diplomatic circles. And I turn to Ambassador Shimbiri Malande. Um, what is your, your, your perspective on that? And I know that under your tenure at the, the, the Malawian cabinet, as well as UNDP, you fought very hard, not just to push for more democratic governance, but also to fight uh, sexual and gender-based violence. So how, how do we address, or rather, how do we understand that we should fight both battles together? Thank you very much. Um, I really thank the organizers to, for, for inviting me to be here, to share our experiences, to share our perspectives of Africa. Indeed, um, what I see is that in the past few years, whilst the problems were already there of food security and others, 
there is something that has gone wrong, that at decision-making level, we do not think about who is this decision going to hurt. We've been, um, the global decision makers have been forgetting the real people down out there, whether in Africa, in less developed countries, even in their own countries, there are women and children that suffer because of certain decisions that are not considering them. And really, the food system has been affected at the production level, at the processing level, at even packaging level. You know, if you go through this chain, the supply chain of the production, food production, packaging, processing, moving, transporting, and even selling the markets that he mentioned, the consumption has been affected. The cost of living has grow, gone up and households have to make decisions because certain decisions have been made up there. There's financial crisis because of certain decisions. There are, there's a debt crisis in our countries. There's also energy crisis with the climate change. And you know, COVID made it worse. Everything stopped. And now women are struggling even more because they can't even produce. They, they, they were blocked from making any income, from making any little business, from even going to do some work in the agriculture field because that's where they work more. And, and because of that, and then fertilizer has increased a lot. Food prices have increased with the inflation. Everything has increased. All the commodities have increased. And now the poorest of the poorest cannot cope. The nations who are poor cannot cope. So you know what? What we need is needed is that the global decision makers, the powers that are there, need to think as they are whatever decisions they are making to think of what are the poor nations, how is this going to affect the poor nations, even their own resource envelope, because you are aiding us, and then if the decisions are going to disrupt the food system in this case, or the energy supplies in this case, then the whole supply chain is affected. Even the resource envelope of the developed countries will be affected and the most hurt will be the women and children. And then that's the real source of life, women and children. And the youth, don't forget the youth as well. We have a youth dividend, particularly in least developed countries in Africa. We have a huge population of the youth, but they are also forgotten when we are making decisions. And they need, we need to capitalize on this. With the technology, what we have learned from COVID, the digital technology, digital transformation is key to keep connectivity, digital payments, digital um, processes. Even we need to digitize agriculture, the youth will be the uh, resource that we need to use. There's something that, talking about food security, we, we tend to overlook far too often. It's the, 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 the resources from the sea and the ocean. And I'd like to turn to Ambassador Orkovin, uh, who is joining us online. Um, looking at the future potential of food production from the ocean uh, and the opportunities uh, for achieving the sustainable development goal at zero hunger through ocean-based food, um, the prospect is actually quite positive. Um, what is the role of seafood in, in the global food security? And I know, Ambassador, that you, you've worked tremendously uh, hard on, 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 those, on those issues. But of course, the, 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 the related question is that of how do we make sure that we also double down on our efforts to clean out the oceans and reach carbon neutrality. But I think this specific dimension is, is, is far too often overlooked in, 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 the, in the, the, the discussion. I, Ambassador, I think that you're speechless. I'm speechless because of the problem. Good. And why we cannot solve it. Uh, and good morning. And it's more than a pleasure to be with you. Although, really, of course, my compliments to the Belgian government for this excellent forum. 
And I, before I go to the oceans, uh, and I would say the food uh, coming from the oceans, I'm still surprised. And also, I would say straight that we are not more nervous. Because we're sitting here in a forum where we know now, and it is not that it's because of the recent crisis like the COVID 19 or the Ukraine war, is that we are aiming or getting to a $1 billion, or $1 billion number of people in Hungary in the next year. And so we are quite relaxed and we say that we know the answers, but where is the action? And we know, of course, and I very much agree with what was already said by uh, our members of the panel, especially what was said by Agnes. We know that the business as usual and the current track is not feasible anymore. If we really want to do something about food security, food security, it has to be done at the national level. And it means, and also for my 30 year years in the national field, is that we need to strengthen the mechanism as well as coordinate action to the end, but in a different manner. Because we should be nervous that until last year, the prime ministers at Hunga were not speaking about food security. It was only climate change and food security was left to the Minister of Agriculture, not at UN headquarters. Look, that has been changed. But I think if you look to climate change, I think the crisis with food security is even going better than uh, when it comes to climate change. So we need to address them at the highest political level. Only then we get the commitment to really implement the commitments we already made during the last couple of years. That also means that we take it seriously that the UN is ruled by equity and equality. Too often I hear diplomats of the US and the European Union saying that we have to follow their, their I would say, ideas because they are the biggest donors. No developing country is by choice a developing country. So they should be based and treated in equality, listening to what their needs are, I think, especially at the national level. But I think one clear sign which has to be, uh, I'll say, broken down is the silence of the private sector. To see this forum, perhaps for the next forum, I think somebody, a company of the company, should be a member of the forum. But only you can work with the private sector at the national level. And if we remember, and I will give an example later, you can make sure that we come closer to the solutions we need. And that's why I say at the global level, I think we all agree. Or many of the elements which were tabled today and tabled in the UN, tabled in Rome and in New York. But we have to focus on the national level. And it means that we have to bring to the, to the table those who can make sure that we can, can get action at the national level. And that's not only government, because too often it's thought that governments can rule the world and find the solutions. Only if we bring the private sector at the table. We know that we can find investments and corporate solutions also for farmers in uh, Africa. We don't need, what my experience, we don't need more global funds. But you see with Jeff and with the Green Fund, it takes one to two years and about half a million dollars to get the program approved. I think what happened in the last two years, if you have proposed a program to the Green Fund, what we need is to get investments on the ground by the private sector in joint cooperation with governments and NGOs. And for that, of course, in the UN, we have national pathways. But what I see for practice now is national pathways are too much treated as a top of our policies. It should be a national path, should be a guide for investments of public and companies. In those elements of a, those elements of an, uh, for example, food losses, uh, and in, uh, which need to be treated at the national level, and that means that you can do it. And one example, for example, is food losses is low hanging fruit. We all one third is lost. If you are developing, improving your national uh, pathway, and your uh, you can focus and priority should be given to food loss. What we have done, for example, in Nigeria now with the World Bank, supported by FEO, the World Resource Institute, is we are now developing a strategic plan for Nigeria where we are going to improve 
the food losses in the gas sector with, uh, for example, Fina, which will go, will invest $50 million in, a, in, a, in, um, in Nigeria to improve property and quality. That's how it can be done. And I think when we look to this forum, I think it's very important that we see how we can scale up to, those examples. Coming to the oceans, I think we know how important the oceans are and especially the, the food and production. When it comes to human health, children health, but also there that we have to strive for inclusivity. And we have to protect not only, uh, I would say, our food uh, incomes, but also our uh, biodiversity. And for that, it's important, it was already referred to as science and policy and innovations. But often what we see is that innovations are available in countries in the European Union and in the United States. But many of the innovations, also when it comes to fisheries, are not available or implementable in countries like in Africa or ocean countries. I think we have to focus on how can we take action to make those innovations available, implementable, and available for fishermen in, uh, for example, small island development states. They need to have not only the, the, their access, but with the access, we have to develop their food system also getting access to markets and make sure that they can deliver not only that they also can deliver food to save for this. It's a joint effort, I think, mm -hmm. with governments in the lead, of course, the joint co leading by the private sector and some important, uh, I would say, important NGOs. Thank you. And, think, and then I'm close with the sentence. I think this forum can only be remembered not what we have said, but what action can be taken coming out of this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think something that, that you seem to be referring to as well is the, necess the need to better um, policy analysis frameworks. And I'd like to turn to Professor Rieves because I know that, that you've worked a lot also on policy assessment um, so as to make the necessary adjustments. Thank you, but first we have to understand uh, the whole system. And we heard a lot of uh, uh, good explanation, but uh, as an as economist and agriculture engineer, I see the food insecurity as an uh, uh, equation with uh, following uh, independent variables. First is the man-made uh, conflicts, internal and external. All war conflicts are making food insecurity problems. The second is, of course, natural disasters and climate policy changes or climate crisis, which is uh, making, uh, uh, increasing the poverty, increasing the in food insecurity. The third is, uh, of course, also in, uh, in external uh, support or external impacts of, uh, of, of global market systems, but also uh, humanitarian aid and foreign aid. Uh, where, where I think we can we can see uh, very good practices, but also some uh, some weaknesses and some wrong pro uh, policies. I have feeling that uh, we from the global north we don't understand anymore the global south. With the growing populism, it's very difficult to touch all this issue. We become so egoistic that is from day to day we understand uh, uh, less. Not to speak about the. Uh, uh, foreign aid, where exactly we need, and this is the, the fourth element, there is no food insecurity, uh, food insecurity uh, uh, solution without uh, investments in the agriculture, in the agro-food system, in the social relation in the rural uh, areas, so with a strong in investment. And we know that those countries, the less developed uh, countries are not able to finance this. We need strong support from, uh, from the North, but strategic one, with like the colleagues uh, from FAO told us, uh, we need strategic planning, we need uh, policy which is targeted, tailored, consistent, stable, not corrupt, not related only to the tycoons uh, or separate uh, elites of the, of the countries and so on. And then it's a fifth condition or fifth determinant, which is very, very important. It's a governance quality of the countries. If we have corruption, if we don't have a rule of law, but a rule of power, you cannot do anything. And, uh, and we have to ask ourselves, 
we from the north, are we doing enough to support the people there, the, the democracies there, the rule of law there? I think we have a lot of cases in the last decades and last century where uh, exactly with the pol policy interventions, uh, we changed the situation so strongly uh, that it's become to the uh, conflicts and, and, and it's coming to the conf conflicts and, and food insecurity. So what Western is doing well or uh, North is doing well, uh, reform the policies here but we have to understand the situation better. We have to invest more. We have to help the democracies to grow up. We have to work for the people, for the small farmers, for the agro-food system and for the rural development and not to come with our own mind and ideas to those countries. This means we need also institution, knowledge institutions. We need a new, I will say not green, but sustainable revolution, evolution of the, uh, for the less developed countries. Everything is clear. All institutions, all organizations, the academical world put the right questions on the table. The question is, uh, to conclude is, why we are not changing more? Thank you so much for that. I'd like to, to take the ball uh, of the last point you raised regarding good governance and turn to Assistant Secretary Sisson. You, you, you have a, 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 an impressive track record of, of diplomatic positions, dipl diplomatic posts in uh, conflict or post-conflict regions. And as much as um, food security is linked to climate change, um, so it seems it is to a good governance as well, SDG 16. So, in your view, do we take enough into account that good governance dimension uh, in the approach to food security and to strengthening food security? No, thanks for that follow-on question. And I think if you look at, at SDG 16, you see um, the focus on governance, the focus on strong institutions, but also the focus on Inclusivity, you see the word inclusive and the word inclusivity in there. So I'm gonna go back uh, to the comment my colleague just made on, on women. So when you look at how do we get to governance, that's bringing in the voices of women, that's bringing in the voices of youth, that's bringing in the voices of civil society. So uh, when you look uh, right now at the Horn of Africa, which is you know four years into a situation of extreme drought, uh, when you look at Somalia on the brink of famine, who's being impacted? Women, that's gonna have an impact on girls' education, that's gonna have an impact on maternal health, that's the whole future of the country. So you need this inclusive approach, you need this approach to governance. I'm gonna go back to the point on, uh, I, I touched on, on, on NGOs though. Um, you know, thank you, Martin, for, for noting um, the US support for WFP, and in fact, um, you know, in May, our president and our Congress announced, uh, you know, $760 million for uh, the approach uh, to combating global food insecurity, not just WFP and, and FAO and EFAD, but, but across many implementing partners and many implementing agencies. But there again, we look at the role, as we keep saying, of the private sector and civil society. Civil society, NGOs, inclusivity. Civil society, NGOs in the field rural areas, working with smallholder farmers, they're the ones who need to be supported in launching innovation hubs. Uh, civil society, NGOs, they're the ones who need to be supported in the sharing of information on climate resistant technologies. Again, um, improving farmers' access to market information. All of this needs to be taken uh, as a whole package. And if I can have the floor for just one minute longer, I did uh, mention innovation and private sector, but seeing Ambassador with the FAO uh, uh, you know, flags uh, behind you, I, I recently had the opportunity to travel to Zybersdorf in Austria, where IAEA and the peaceful uses part of IAEA and FAO have a number of cutting edge uh, research labs on food and doing some amazing work. And when you mentioned uh, millet and sorghum, and I went into the nurseries there and saw uh, what FAO and IAEA are doing together um, on millet and sorghum and, and, and many other foodstuffs. So uh, I did not want to give uh, short shrift to what 
the, the scientific uh, and technological innovation supported by the member states through uh, the UN agencies are doing as well. But we need to take this inclusive approach to SDGs, including SDG 16. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to, to uh, turn to Martin uh, Frick. Um, as, as we all know, the, the brave commander ship is yet is about to uh, reach the harbor in Djibouti. So that is the, the, the big shipment uh, that left last week, um, the harbor of Odessa, with 23,000 tons of grain. Um, You've exerted yourself over the past months in making sure that, that um, an agreement between Russia and Ukraine would be, uh, would be signed so that we could uh, make sure that um, those uh, thousands of tons of grain would not rot uh, in the harbor. Um, and, and you have been at the forefront of the battle to also make sure that the first victims of, of that would not be the most fragile populations in the Horn of Africa. Um, is this trend here to stay if we look at the prospects for next year? So uh, on that boat, you have 23,000 tons. Uh, in Odessa, you have 23 million tons. Um, and the forecasts seem to indicate that we are about to lose every year twice that amount because of the combination of rising conflicts and climate change. Um, is this trend here to stay? And if it isn't, or what could be put in place so that we make sure that that trend is not here to stay? Okay, I'll give you a two-part answer. One is the immediate humanitarian need. And even with the best efforts to get ships out of the Black Sea, we are basically seeing 50% of the Ukrainian ports being usable and about 10% of the pre-war capacity. So it's a good start and, you know, it creates hope, and hope is important in that situation. But 23,000 tons is not much. Um, we absolutely need to create a longer-term perspective. I mean, just to give you an idea, last year the World Food Program had its biggest budget ever, a bit over $9 billion, and we were 43% underfunded. We might get a similar amount of money this year, maybe even a little bit more, but we will be 50% underfunded. Well, that's an estimate. So you see that the gap between the humanitarian need and the available support is widening all the time. Um, sometimes saying you don't have as many feet as you need to trample out all the fires. So we need to do something substantially different. And I think, you know, the point that, you know, you made about good governance is a very, very significant one. The experiences that my organization has made that, you know, we are operating in many countries in which state structures are weak, sometimes even not existing. But you need to look at the circles of responsibility. And if you go to a local community, that circle of responsibility is working. People are taking responsibility. They are working for and with each other. And our best results are really <clears throat> when we can go <clears throat> to local communities, support them, help them getting organized, um, getting them access to inputs, creating um, legal security, which is most important, particularly for women. This is when you can build um, from the bottom up. Um, and I think mistakes were made in Africa in thinking that replicating a big industrial scale agriculture model would work in African countries. I think it's the exact opposite. It's the smallholder farmers. It's the bottom up action. It's small labor intensive agriculture because A, there are so many young people who are looking for livelihoods and are happy to have a job. And B, um, if you want to withstand droughts, climate shocks and so on, you need to have diverse cropping systems. You need to have um, different sources of income. So if one source of income fails you, um, you don't stand there with empty hands, but you've got resilient systems. And for example, in agroforestry models, mixing forestry and agriculture in an intelligent way, most importantly, and I cannot say that loud enough, rebuilding soils 
composting, bringing organic matter back in the soils to create fertile ground where we lost arable land is of paramount importance. And these are low-tech interventions. We are talking about little money. We are talking about local interventions. But the biggest point here is to create the security and get the communities organized. I, I think, Assistant Secretary, you, you'd like to jump on that. I just wanted to, to note and, and thank you for raising uh, the Black Sea Grain Initiative. And obviously, it is early days. It is early days, 23,000 tons. It is early days, three, three weeks or so uh, that the ships have been moving. And you know, full credit uh, to, to Secretary General Guterres and, and WFP and OCHA and UNCTAD and the IMO, uh, the UN agencies involved. But I think we have to remember that Russia needs to meet its commitments. I think we have to also remember that Russia needs to end its unjustified, unprovoked war on Ukraine because farmland is still being destroyed. Farmers are still being affected. The ports are at risk. So the, this initiative, it is early days. It is to be commended, but it is just one part of the story. Um, and also just thank you for the focus again on, on smallholder farmers as we look as the United States on how we best support uh, through WFP, through FAO, through the International uh, Fund for Agricultural Development, EFAD, the focus has to be on the smallholder farmers in, in those rural areas, whether we're talking about soil mapping, whether we're talking about um, sharing of, of techniques, um, this is where our focus is as well. Thank you. I, I'd like to turn to Ambassador Shimberi Malande because I know you've been working tremendously hard on, on securing more uh, fund for um, local farmers, um, not just in Malawi, but on the, in the region. Um, the importance and impact of climate finance in that region is far more, uh, far stronger than what we think. And I know that, that you, your role was instrumental a few months ago in securing a first conceptualization of how we could um, raise more fund to um, accompany all those uh, farmers uh, into a more uh, sustainable uh, production system. So how do we, um, on the one hand, there are the humanitarian needs and they've been soaring, but that should not mean that we should also forget, of course, private sector uh, development, as Ambassador Orban stressed, but also that, that the question of, of, of climate finance specifically for Africa. Thank you. Uh, indeed, um, what we've noted dealing with uh, the issue of climate change is that uh, silos approach, country-specific approach to climate action has not really worked that well. Um, the way the climate disasters are impacting on the various regions in the Pacific, in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's really holistic. When um, the cyclones hit Mozambique, for example, in Southern Africa, it affects uh, several countries, including my own Malawi. And uh, what um, the, 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 the population there has lost uh, crops, uh, animals, even lives, and so, their lives are not sustainable, and what we need is um, capacity building to, for adaptive living. So what we've been discussing with our partners in, in the UN in New York is that really how do we bring forward or mobilize climate financing that will take a regional approach, that will take a holistic approach, so that we are really addressing the climate change from all angles. So we are conceptualizing, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a regional approach that will focus on the basins, water basins. So entry point will be the water. Water is life, and there are a number of water resources in Africa, uh, but they are not being used, they are not being capitalized. And we feel that the water basins in Africa could be the entry point for peace, entry point for you know, I guess sustainable agriculture for using irrigation, entry point for even managing the climate change, entry point for water, source of water, clean water, even energy, producing energy. And Africa, for example, also has a multitude of solar energy, but we do not have enough of the solar technology 
This is where the international community can come and help us with the technology, technology transfer so that we are able to have um, solar energy in all our rural areas. And with that, it is going to, uh, you know, to protect the environment because there will be no um, uh, abuse of the uh, forest. And uh, people who have energy, lighting, even for the schools with solar energy, for the health systems with solar energy, they'll be able to access health services, education services, and even, you know, at the household level, clean energy. So we are looking at the interconnectedness of the climate problem, the problem of the financial crisis, even the problem of, uh, you know, recovering from COVID. We are looking at all that together, but taking a regional approach, taking a joint approach. So what we are saying is that in international cooperation is very critical this time around, and South-South cooperation can also be a better channel for that change to happen. We need the reforms at all levels. Thank you very much for that. I, I'd like to follow up because I, I know that, that the U.S. has been at the forefront of bringing um, um, more, more uh, um, uh, partners in, in, in uh, investment cooperation, but I'd like to, to first um, ask uh, Professor Ryavets and, and you, Dr. Aniotis. Um, Professor Ryavets, you told, about, you told us about a kind of Western selfishness. And I think this definitely refers to the question of the mindset. And, and we have an audience here physically present in that room. We have an audience online. We're all consumers. We buy, uh, we eat. Um, and if I look at the figures, um, over 240 million slices of bread are thrown away every year. Around 6 million glasses of milk are poured down the sink. And we throw away almost 6 million potatoes every year. So if we look at the figures, it's, it's, it's clear that we actually produce enough. We, have, we are actually producing enough to feed everyone on the planet. It's just that some have much more and throw away and others don't have enough. So how, from a policy perspective, and I turn to the both of you, uh, do we address that? Because, it, and I think it's, 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 a, it's a Western question, or let's say a European question, as far as, of course, the EU is concerned. You can... Yeah, me first. <coughs> the solution is not that we, on the North, are producing for the South. Because what we are doing with the agriculture we know that there are several negative impacts on climate, on biodiversity, on, on environment, and so on. What is the solution is very clear. We have to help to assist the South to develop their own agriculture, local economies, agro-food systems, of course, on modern way, with, with solutions, uh, uh, innovations, and, 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 and so on. So what we need is specific targeted program at local level and regional level in the, in the I would say, less developing, less developing world to help them, but not patronizing them with their own solution, with our own mindset, but to work with them that they are able to, to, to make a good governance, to make a, a, a own solution, and sometimes very primitive instruments. Sometimes it is enough to give uh, the local communities, I don't know, milk uh, canes or milk f f free small one, like we had 100 years ago. Uh, sometimes it's enough not to give them the tractors, but motor cultivators or, or, or so very specific one. Somebody is doing this and with a, with a huge success, but also with a huge price for, West, for Western South relations, but also for the uh, less developing countries themselves. So we need to work with developing countries much more seriously, much more fairly, and with much more investments in people, institutions, and money. So if I, before we move to, to Tassios, if I understand you correctly, the North should produce less and the South more. And so we would kind of... Uh, it, it, is, it will be structural break, so or so. Now we are pushing our, uh, our supplies to them, but not also West, also emerging countries, Brazil and so on, and China is coming, Russia is here. So, you know, a lot of countries, this is the global market chance, you cannot influence them. This is a market economy. But uh, what we need, 
because trade is important growing factor for, for all, all of them. But the Western have to realize that if we support the agriculture and agro-food system, we have to do this with sustain in sustainable way. So not to, to push like, you know, uh, like here in our, uh, our region uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, we are all dreaming about the food security. You know, it is perverse, it is bizarre. We do not have food security problem here because we have food security problem in hundreds of countries in the other continents. But we use food security issue as arguments to keep very primitive uh, policy protectionism, to keep distribution of money to specific farmers, to specific uh, type of production with all possible negative impacts on trade, environment, people, and also our own rural areas. So we have to reform. And Europe is on, on the good way. We are in the, we open, and I think Tassos will now uh, explain this much better than me. We are on the reform pattern, but we have to include also less developing countries in our, uh, how to say, mindset. But well, although someone would disagree when you say that we have no food insecurity here because we've run out of French mustard, but that's another, <laughs> that's another discussion. Um, I, I'm still not convinced about how we address that food waste, which is tremendously um, obscene, sorry to use that word, but that's how I feel it, um, in the so-called advanced economies. How have you dealt with that when at the Commission, uh, Dr. Niotis? I think you, you raised a question that probably is for another panel because the first thing that one has to do is find out the right numbers. Uh, and that's one of the problems that I have had with food waste. I mean, we're living in a world that is driven by profit. So if food waste were really 30%, I w you wonder why didn't people use it more? I mean, the real number is much lower. That doesn't mean that it's not important. But it means that it's extremely different at the level of primary production, at the level of industry, which is much smaller, at the level of consumption, which is much greater, retail, hotels, restaurants. It's a very diverse issue that has to be addressed in a different way. And one of the things that I know that uh, my colleagues in the former colleagues, as you say now, in the Joint Research Center are working in trying to find out uh, this. But I think, uh, I mean, the discussion we have brings me to some of the, I mean, you've seen a paper, which is the last slide of what I wanted to do in some of the issues that I wanted to raise. Because I will start with, uh, one point, uh, Emil, I, I think we agree, but I disagree with the way that you phrased it. Uh, food security is a global problem. Yeah. And that's why we should not talk on whether we have a food security problem in the US, in the EU, or Africa, or what have you. It's a global problem. And whether we need to produce more or less in one or the other area, it's something that is very complex to identify. One thing is clear. At the global level, we need to produce more food and we need to produce it with less inputs and less damage on the environment. So that's the first thing that we all agree. Second, uh, we have the tendency to very often move, if you look at 2015 with today, from self-congratulation to self-flagellation. Reality is somewhere in the middle. And I take the point that you raised, Ambassador, about the tendency to forget the losers. Uh, I was a bureaucrat, but also with very strong links with the research community, we learn very early in our academic careers that trade is beneficial because it increases the overall welfare, provided that we have mechanisms whereby winners compensate the losers. And that provided is something we forget. In the European Union, we have it in some form. So policies at global level, it doesn't exist. That's why it, it, trade liberalization raises so many uh, resistance uh, to this change. And the third thing that you mentioned is extremely important is the transfer of law. Let's, first of all, the production of new law, let's, but also the transfer, the mechanisms that are missing. Now, if you put this in the politic, uh, policy context, I see three areas where we need to move from a polarization of the debate to a synthesis, a synergies. But synergies require to first recognize the tensions, and we've seen them in the debate that we had in the European Union with the Green Deal, the Farm to Fork strategy, and the CAP. The first is we should stop pitting food security against climate action. It's nonsense. It's as if somebody is telling you, what do you have to choose, your stomach or your lungs? You need them both. 
and we need to find concrete ways of taking what already exists on the ground, which is best practices that cover a wide range of areas. There is no monopoly of best practice. Artificial intelligence might be much better in certain areas, organic farming better in other areas, uh, agroecology in between in other areas, and see what it tells us in terms of what works and what in terms of what doesn't work. You mentioned ambassador, there are many ambassadors here, uh, the, the term uh, soil. How in the world can we really reduce the level of emissions from agriculture if we don't even have data, basic data, on what different practices do in soil and when we have the data and if we don't use the data? Second false dilemma. This uh, issue about, and we had it a lot in Europe, probably you don't have it that much in, uh, in Africa because the money is not there. Public versus private goods. I mean, you need them both. Farmers produce private goods with markets that do not function perfectly. There are major imperfections in agricultural markets when it comes to the pr uh, price formation and the price transmission. So you need to find ways where the public money that goes for the production of both public and private goods is better linked. We have done efforts in that. We need to do much more. And third, false dilemma, global versus local. And you need both. We need a rebalancing. We need trade, and that's why you need global solutions, but you need to strengthen the local one. And since, allow me uh, half a minute, because I have a question if you want for those that are more experts in the developing world than I have been, which is another dilemma that I see. When you talk to developing countries and the, the poor in developing countries, what is in terms of prices best. For the rural poor, it's higher prices. For the urban poor, it's not higher food prices. So you need some policy solution there that we haven't even started debating that will generate a completely different setting of policy instruments that would allow us actually to address food security issues. I think that's the best question that I was not able to ask, obviously. Uh, we, we have, I'm afraid, we have less than five minutes, and I realize we have not taken any questions from the audience. So what I'd like to do is I would obviously have need to uh, and want to leave our panelists a few minutes to, to wrap up. I'd like to take perhaps one or two questions if, 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 you, have, if you have some, otherwise we'll just move. Yes, please, we have a microphone, yes. Dilla. Hello. Uh, my name is Sasha Nožić Serini. I'm president of Organization for Developing Digitalization in Agriculture. So my question is for all, how you see this food and security perspective in this uh, way of digitalization of agriculture? So just Thank to you so much. If, if there's another question, we'll take it then over there. And then the lady, no, sorry, the lady over there. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Maya Zibert. I'm coming from Slovenia. I finished this year the study of agriculture. Um, when I was a student, I had an opportunity to work in a store. Mm, I really appreciate that opportunity. And I saw how many food large chains of stores throw away at the end of the day. And I was asking myself many times why. Why, what, what can we do? To, to fight against that. So it will be the same question as uh, already the moderator gave it, give it it, but I've got also, a so I mean, uh, it's a solution. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Maybe it's too much Good. revolutionarity. Shall we increase the fees for those stores, for those chains of stores who are really rich and they are the main pl players for all the waste food, for all the waste mm -hmm. of food. Mm -hmm. And that's that then we can develop in the other countries. Would this Thank work? you very much. So a kind of tax system. I think that's a very, very important point. Uh, I'm afraid we we r really running out of time. If 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 your question is a compliment, we will take it of course. But please, please be, be, be as short as you can. Andrei and Kajvik from Slovenia. It's not a compliment. It's a compliment to oh, WHO. Compli compliment, not compliment. Oh, okay. No, it's, but, a, but open to it's compliment. a compliment to WFP. Congratulations on your winning Nobel Prize for Peace last year. Uh, and I was astonished. You said 9 billion year budget. I think it's too low. 
I think, uh, as Madam President says yes, yesterday, said on the panel on the opening, 300 billion to green tech, but 9 billion budget for WFP. I think you should get 100 times more funding, and that would be first step of uh, solution to uh, world hunger. Thank you. Next time we'll have the president on the panel and you can direct the question. Thank you so much. What, what I'd really like to do is, is, I'm afraid we really need to wrap up, is asking all of our panelists to share uh, one, one very, in, in as little time as you possibly can, like 60 seconds, um, both the impossible question, both addressing some of the, the issues, and I think the one on digitization is very important indeed, and the second is what, in your view, should be the priority that world leaders should address to make sure that food insecurity stays a slogan. And I will start with you, Assistant uh, State Secretary. So on digitalization, I think that goes back to the numbers uh, question, uh, most likely, and the need for us to focus on data, including soil mapping, so we can get to the facts and actually develop good policies. On, on the 60 seconds, um, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. I think we need to continue, of course, to look at the short-term um, needs on food assistance. We need to look, continuing to look at the short-term relief for smallholder farmers. Uh, at the same time, as many of us have said, going um, even deeper into the need for long-term investment in research and the long-term uh, thinking on, on resilience building. I think the multilateral system, uh, the UN agencies and the rest of the multilateral system has deepened and accelerated its response. We saw this in May in our UN Security Council presidency. We saw this in July at the G7 ministerial. We're going to see this in September in the New York a high level week for the UN General Assembly, but it's got to go much further beyond that. We've got to work with uh, the international financial institutions and look at what the international financial institutions can do to focus again on the smallholder farmers and building social safety nets. That's my 60 seconds. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Frick? Two times 30 seconds. Um, the first 30 seconds on digitalization absolutely a game changer. We see it wherever local population have access um, to modern digital devices um, for three reasons, basically. One is market transparency, does miracles. We had a group in Latin America that for the first time understood what the prices for coffee actually are. They've been robbed by a local person for 10 years before they understood that they were selling way too cheap information about how to do agriculture and also digital payments that reach people directly without any inefficiency and corruption. So absolute game changer. Um, but I also want to answer Maya's questions because that's a very, very good one. I think we have learned that a good shop is a shop that offers all the variety until Saturday evening, 8 o'clock. And we try to ignore that everything is being thrown away until the shop reopens on Monday morning. Um, I don't like to push responsibility to consumers because it's always cheap. Um, it's a joint responsibility of governments, of consumers, of shops as well. But I think we always understand the reduction of choice as having a poorer life. I would disagree. When I was a boy, strawberries were only available in June. And what a party it was to have strawberries. Now you have it all year long and they don't taste and they don't, basically they look like strawberries, but they don't fulfill what you want to have. So if we go back a little bit more to the local and seasonal availability, we do miracles for the climate, we do a lot for social equity, and we also have a bit more fun in our lives. Thank you so much. I think that the WFP's time allocation is growing more quick, quickly than your budget. <laughs> uh, Ambassador Ochoven. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think, as you always, already said up until the platform, showing how important the digital information is. And we have seen practices already where farmers can detect diseases with the mobile devices. Scaling up those practices is enormous challenge, but also an opportunity to find food security. Secondly, I think it's important that we support farmers who are introducing climate smart practices. For that, I think we should 
that we're working on it now is to install a carbon credit system for farms where farmers are being paid for installing those practices as well as planting trees. Thirdly, when it comes to, uh, I would say, food loss and food waste, tackle food loss via national pathway together with, I say, focus much more on the national pathway to support the global level. Only then we can really secure the food accessibility for farmers in Africa. Last but not least, when it comes to the com companies, I think it's very important to give the facts and numbers the awareness of the companies who is doing best in sustainability. And it's also show facts and figures for companies who are throwing away less than other companies. That will influence the consumer figure. Thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador Shimberi Melandi. I just wanted to add that uh, digital governance will be key in uh, everywhere in the world digitalization, digital transformation, e-payments, it will reduce corruption, it will make people access any payments very easily. Um, so I felt that I could raise that. And um, linking up the, you mentioned the, 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 the farmers, the small farmers, they need to be linked to the markets. So in Africa, we have the Africa Common Trade Area that we have now. Um, let's link up the small farmers to this world market. They are going to benefit more than what is happening now. Thank you. Stage champion for staying within the 60 second limit. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Tasso Saniotis. I will also stay in, try to stay uh, focusing only on digitalization. Digitalization brings to mind to me at least one issue, or three gaps we have in knowledge. The generation of new knowledge, the gaps in the transfer of existing knowledge, and also the gaps in the perception of knowledge, and especially on science. What digitalization does in itself, it actually generates enormous potentials to bridge these gaps. But at the same time, it raises the major issue of who has access to digitalization. And that is the issue that we have to address from a policy perspective. Second champion, thank you so much. And, and, and Professor Ariavitz. Digitalization in uh, Africa and Latin America is one of the really important and positive things. We can see how the farmers are looking on mobile phone, their financial status, advice, prices, and so on. Food waste, uh, I think this is the governance issue. If we will include, and I am thinking uh, a lot of, about this in our, uh, how to say, market uh, uh, governance system that, uh, for instance, the banks are not giving uh, the cheap loans to those who are not doing uh, 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 comparable with the uh, uh, SWG, so sustain, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, it will be clear how this uh, practice will be changed. But uh, uh, additionally, it is also the matter of attitudes, education. The problem is that we make uh, the food uh, uh, as consum consumerism uh, element, and we have to bring food m more back to the human, human, uh, human being. And the last sentence, we have to invest in the people. In the, in the, in the, if we would like to solve the food insecurity problem. Thank you so much. I think we all agree that we have had the best panel in, in this <laughs> forum. So thank you so much. Um, I think we've actually, we've actually came up with uh, far more answers than we would have thought in the beginning. Uh, before we all leave, and because I don't want to increase your food insecurity by standing between you and the lunch, um, I must say that, that we have been less gloomy than I would have thought, um, and as I would, uh, I, as I would have anticipated uh, a more negative tone, I, I wanted to leave the last word to a poet. After all, we should always leave the last word to a poet. Um, American poet, Nobel laureate, Louis Gluck, who actually wrote a few, a few verses on abundance, which I think would uh, be something that we would like to all leave with. So the moon is full, a strange sound, comes from the field, maybe the wind, but for the mice, it's a night like any summer night, fruit and grain, a time of abundance, nobody dies, nobody goes hungry, no sound expect the roar of the wheat. And with that hope at heart and in mind, I thank you all and wish you a very uh, happy day. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>